Hi there, this is Joe Meadows and welcome to Safety Leaders Now, the show where we cut through the noise and identify the strategies and tactics that today's top safety leaders use to keep their teams safe. On today's episode, we have Eric Meyer. Eric is currently heading up safety at Crusoe Energy. And one of the reasons I was so excited to get him on the show is not only is Crusoe an incredibly cool company that I'm personally very interested in, but beyond that, they're in a situation where they've raised a lot of money. They've got that kind of Silicon Valley backing while they're also doing performing operations that are very traditional and and have a lot of overlap with kind of traditional safety practices. So I thought that getting his perspective on how is he running safety in this environment where they have tons of money in the bank, they have the opportunity to do things not only the right way, but to do things in a new way if they choose to would be a conversation that people would be interested in. So I really enjoyed it. I hope you do as well. And without further ado, here's my conversation with Eric. All right, Eric, thanks for being here. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about who, like, sort of where you work and what you do there? Okay. Uh, well, I work for, for Crusoe Energy, and uh, we do digital flare mitigation, and I'm the, uh, the health and safety manager, um, soon to be international, as we have some international projects coming up, uh, but really just kind of in charge of uh, health and safety. We keep it separate from the environmental, which is... Uh, hired or handled in our operations group. So we have uh, okay, operate, or I handle operations and I know uh, it's way long. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I, I get you. So, so let's, before we dive into all the health and safety stuff, I think people or I'm personally, um, I think what Crusoe's doing is super cool. I've had, I've met up with, or I saw Cully at a few events and I've heard him talk about it. And I think, you know, he does a great job of that, but can you, can you give us the kind of quick and dirty version of, what does digital flare mitigation mean? Well, so digital flare mitigation, um, you kind of always talk about oil wells. Um, I always think of it like a juice box. You know, when you were a kid out on the playground, you, you blow into the juice box and uh, it gets that, that in there. And then it, it kind of pushes the juice and gets it spraying out of the top of the, uh, out of the straw. Yeah. And that's pretty much how um, oil wells, uh, how they flow and how they produce. So there's natural gas that uh, produces hydrostatic pressure in the well. And that's what causes the oil to flow. So, you know, oil is, is, is really easy, right? It's a liquid. You can capture that. You can put it in trucks. You can kind of do whatever you need to do. You know, gas is something that's completely separate. And so it's a little bit harder to capture. So what you find with, I think it's about 20% is the number, about 20% of um, uh, oil production, you know, produces natural gas that gets flared off. And so that natural gas, it's just really no way to capture it, no economically feasible way to get it to market they just burn it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that being the case with emissions, uh, you know, regulations and kind of all these things and, and just simply wanting to, you know, have a, not be reducing so much and making oil quite so dirty. Um, Mm -hmm. What we do is we take the natural gas and uh, we put equipment out onto well sites, uh, large uh, generators, and uh, we have a turbine now running. And what we do is we pretty much build data centers on well sites. So we take that, that stranded energy that would otherwise be burned off. We turn that into energy. And from that, we run uh, you know, really high intense uh, computing uh, operations. And we do, uh, for the most part right now, it's, it's Bitcoin mining. Uh, but we have some other really kind of cool and exciting things that are uh, starting to happen. But you know, pretty much any type of, of, you know, any type of computing that needs to be done and, it, you know, it's, it's kind of a cool thing because, of course, you know, one of the big the, the veins of crypto, as you read about it, and, um, you know, there's all these, these complaints about uh, the, the amount of energy, and it, it takes so much energy to do it. And, um, you know, the great thing about that is the more energy that it takes, the more gas and, and more flaring that we can, uh, that we can mm. prevent and shut down. So it's really kind of cool how that, uh, how that feeds each other. For sure. I, I know that on, on my side, you know, when I originally heard about what Crusoe was doing, because I, you know, I, th- this is a growing space, but I know you, you, you know, you guys were kind of the, the pioneers here. It's uh, originally, it seemed like maybe a, a few guys who are partying too hard came up with a, an idea that seemed absolutely insane to me. But really, when you hear the, the details articulated and, and even this idea of what's really the difference between a flare and what you guys are doing, and then hearing it articulated that basically, 
when you're running those otherwise, you know, kind of unused gases through the machinery that you guys are deploying, that you're, you're increasing that uh, combustion efficiency so much. So even though it's kind of being burned either in an engine or just into the air, that by increasing that combustion efficiency, you're turning so much more of that chemical into something, you know, value generating and also not putting into the atmosphere. I, I think it's super amazing. And I think also very strategic that you're taking that you know, what is just fundamentally saying, we're going to put generators here instead of putting this into the atmosphere right. and then looking for that application or how do we generate revenue in situ uh, and, and turning to the, the crypto mining space. It's anyway, kudos, well, to, the, kudos to the founders because it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's an interesting kind of chain of logic. It works out in the end, but a lot of bold moves in there. Well, you, um, you said you had met uh, Cully and, and Cully and Chase, you know, who are the two founders are... Um, I mean, they're just, they're brilliant, first off, mm. and really uh, just great stories between the both of them. But uh, they did actually, this this kind of idea came uh, while climbing Mount Everest. So it might have been somewhat uh, oxygen deprivation yeah. inspired. A little bit uh, of hypoxia but, inspiring this for sure. Exactly. And so that was really kind of where it, it started. And, um, you know, you're not too far off when you talk about the, the genesis of the company. They went out and they had this idea and they kind of thought, you know, can we do this and took a, you know, Honda generator from Lowe's like you or I would get and, and went out uh, to a, to a well site, you know, that first one and, and fired it up to see if they could, uh, if they could do, you know, if they could do computing from a well site and it, and it worked. And, um, you know, I mean, we now have, you know, 60 data centers. Um, I've, I started with the company in June and at that time we, I was employee 59, uh, you know, we now have about 125 employees. So, I mean, the growth is just, it's, it's been outstanding. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's really kind of, I guess one of the cool things about it is when you really start to think about that, you know, that you think about computing and oil and gas and you're like, wow, you know, who came up with the ideas uh, or the idea to come up with you know, to, to do that. But what for me is most exciting is when you think about the differences in the people, um, people that are, are tech folks, you know, your Silicon Valley type folks. And then you take a look at the folks that are in the oil field and, you know, coming from the oil field and, and having done that 12 years where, you know, drilling and completions, you know, we can't get those two groups to get along. Um, and yet here we have these just completely separate, uh, you know, types of people and, and just completely different you know, galaxies for all intents and purposes mm -hmm. and coming together. And it really just the culture with that uh, is really exciting to be a part of. You know, there is, there's not a, um, you know, I know in, in doing oil and gas, you know, when there's an operation or something that's coming up and you're not quite sure what to do, you pull out the old Petro Wiki and you, you kind of read up on it and you get yourself ready. And the next day you're like, okay, I've got this dialed in. But, um, you know, as far as, okay, so we're going to put generators and supercomputers on a well site, you know, let's look up where to find that. And yeah. well, it's never been done before. And so it just, uh, it, it makes it fun to be a part of and, and just really kind of seeing how those two groups of folks that you would think would, would, you know, struggle um, and really just leverage, um, you know, leverage the strengths. We have uh, one of our core uh core values is, is cultivate an idea meritocracy. And we really, you know, we do that. I, you know, from the safety side, there's a lot of folks who've never dealt with a safety person before. And so I'm coming in with this oil and gas background and, you know, I'll get these, these questions that I've never heard before, um, you know, from a tech person, you know, who's, Hey, I'm, I'm doing this lab, you know, how do I set this up? And I'm like, man, I, you know, I hadn't even thought of that. I, you know, have had mud labs before and, and so it's really kind of cool to be able to learn and, and just see that uh, that sharing of knowledge and, and information and expertise uh, within you know within the different departments. For sure. Okay. So so you've 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 teed this up nicely here. I I wanna I guess for for me personally coming from um, you know from my professional background being in the energy space offshore things like that and now for me transitioning into this tech world um it's it's been an i think inspiring to me and and it's it's such a different way to look at the way of doing business i think we can 
get so focused on things being so proceduralized and so, you know, stuck in the way that things are done that I think maybe being around people who approach problems in a very different way has been really interesting to me. And that's, I think, I think that's what I'm really excited to talk to you about today is, um, you know, how are you navigating um, that, that kind of transition and, and what, how does that change with, um, you know, for you coming from kind of an energy background and now operating in this space with all the success that you guys have had and, and things like that. But maybe before we dive into that, I'd, I'd be curious just to set the stage for folks. Um, can you give us the kind of the, the, the quick and dirty rundown of, of what your career looked like up until the point that you got to Crusoe so that we can better understand, you know, for the folks listening, um, the perspective that you're bringing to, to this current challenge? Certainly. So my background, um, I actually started, uh, you know, got out of school and went into the financial services industry. And I did that. Well, I did that for, for quite a few years and worked my, worked my way up. I was actually an executive uh, vice president with a, a couple a couple large companies that you may have heard of. So HSBC, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and that was my background. And I kind of reached a point where I'd, I'd hit where I wanted to hit. And um, I was 37, 38 years old and, uh, you know, had kind of finished up a project that a, a company had, had hired me to come in to do and, and build the, the Western half of the United States um, and build their operations. So at that point had about 500 people. And I'm living in Colorado. That was where I wanted to get back to. And, and they wanted me to move to Boston. And I've never been to Boston, uh, but I know I didn't want to move there. So I, uh, I was like, man, what am I going to do? And I was watching TV and I saw a documentary on Discovery Channel about mountain men. And I was like, man, that would have been cool to be a mountain man, you know? And, and I want to do that, would be awesome. And I would sure love that. And then, you know, a couple, couple hours later, that was right when the boom was happening in the Bakken. And they were interviewing these people living in, in the Walmart parking lot in their cars, you know, trying to get a job. And I just remember being like, man, that's, I bet you that's, people are going to look at that. Like those guys were the mountain men. And, and then the next day I saw, again, saw another documentary on it. And I was like, man, I was like, I, you know, I'm never going to get this chance again. I had a guy that lived down the street who was a, a director, uh, EHS director for Noble Energy. And I asked him, I said, Hey, do you think I could roughneck? And he just laughed and he goes, you could do it. So 38 years old, I, I uh, quit um, the financial services industry, took, uh, took my investments and, and went up to North Dakota and roughnecked uh, for unit drilling and showed up, of course, with, you know, the Red Wing, everything that I thought I needed to have. And, and uh, I'd heard all the horror stories and man, everybody was just awesome and so cool. And I, I couldn't believe it. And uh and then I found out when I came back for my next hitch and, and it really hit hard, it's, they thought that I was on undercover boss. So they were all jockeying to try and get the, you know, $10,000 check to buy a minivan for their, you know, for their wife or send their kids to college. And, um, but anyway, so I, I, I started roughnecking so and did, got, a, I was just going to say, did they, did they stop being nice to you once they realized that wasn't the case? It, it pretty well ended. Uh, yeah, yeah it, was, it was the first, first time somebody told me that they were going to kill me and I believed them. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, so from there, I, I remember driving home and I got a phone call from that same guy. And, uh, he said, Hey, he goes, uh, you got a passport. I said, yeah. And he said, you ever think about doing safety? And I said, no. And, uh, he goes, well, he goes, he goes, look, man, I need you to go to Tel Aviv. I, I need somebody yesterday. And, uh, will you do it? And I said, I said, I don't know, you know, I don't know safety. And he goes, you know how to talk to people and you know how to keep people from getting killed. And that's what I need you to do. And this was back before they had, you know, they didn't even have EHS advisors on rigs, you know. So to have one at, at the docks managing a national workforce was, was something. And so that was really how I got into um, safety was, you know, going into international work in uh, West Africa, in uh, China, in, you know, the, the Middle East. And where you really, you don't have, you can't walk up and tell someone, well, OSHA says you need to do this. You, yeah. you have to walk up and you need to assess risk. You need to figure out what's happening in about 45 seconds. And then you got to figure out how to help these guys do it the right way. So um, you know, I always kind of make the joke that a lot of people know how to stop a job, but the real art is learning how to start it back up in a way that the guys want to do it the right way and want to do it in a safe way. And mm -hmm. so that was my kind of, I guess, trial by fire and really, formed the way that I look at, at safety and, and safe work. 
Yeah, well, it's it's really interesting to hear you say that because I don't know if I've ever I've I've ever thought about it in that way, but I think that you know we've had a few interactions kind of here and there, and I think that there's definitely been things where I, I I've always felt like we're on the same wavelength, and I think that's really where probably where it comes from because I think that there is a certain degree of especially in the energy industry, but also everywhere in safety where doing things in you know in Nigeria or in 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 the in places where you're outside of let's say the OSHA bubble the mm -hmm. conceptualization of what it means to be a safety person is so much different in that it's right. so much less focused on box ticking and compliance and more about mm -hmm. saying if somebody's not here to kind of keep things on the straight and narrow real bad things are going to happen and and right. I think it changes that whole framing in such a meaningful way and I can say that on my side like I've had I sometimes probably have difficulty relating to what is a large part of, let's say, the safety workforce, but but it's just viewed in, you know, so much more of a kind of within the box capacity, and right. that's something where I don't have that background. I've been in scenarios where I had somebody, you know, mess things up or get hurt or, or and, and understanding that risk management side of things, but um, I think, as you said, it's it's a whole different ball game when. OSHA doesn't exist or people right. don't even know what OSHA is. And it's more just about saying, how do we, you know, how, yeah. how do we make sure we, we all get home safe, even if we're coming from totally different backgrounds and you don't care at all what I say to you. Right. Well, I, so I have a son who is now in the Navy and I don't know if this is going to make people feel better about the Navy or worse, but um, so he's now 22 years old. And I remember there was a, a time, it was a buddy of mine. We took him out, we went to eat. He was two years old. And of course, they bring out his little kid's meal, his grilled cheese and his fries. And remember, he, he picks up the pickle and he just kind of stares at it and put it under his chin and just sat there like that. And before I could say anything, my buddy just starts laughing. He goes, you know, somehow that makes sense to him. And I just that has just always kind of stuck with me. Um, you know, you'll walk walk up on a job and, um, you know, there's not one person that wakes up in the morning and says, man, I'm going to go to work today and I'm going to get hurt. And then while I'm at it, I'm going to bust some equipment, too. This is just going to be like a home run kind of day. And, you know, if you just remember that when you walk up, somehow that makes sense to that person. And, you know, it's really a matter of just kind of being able to, to, to talk them through it, um, which, you know, that's, like I said, the, the cool thing with Crusoe is because no one's ever done this before. Uh, you know, when I came, when, when I came to them, I was actually getting ready to go off on another uh, project and I got tagged in a LinkedIn post. And I remember going to the website and, uh, couldn't figure out what they did. I kept reading it. And I'm like, man, this is, this is nuts, you know? And uh, I mean, even to the day of like my first day on the job, I remember like driving to the office thinking to myself, I've either made the biggest mistake of my life, or this is going to be absolutely amazing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm happy to say it was the, it was the latter and, and not the former, because there really is kind of that same creativity. Uh, what, what I, I think they did right. And, and it shows uh, in our retention, the, they really, really kind of kept a stranglehold, for lack of a better term, in the, in the hiring. And to the point where our founders interviewed everyone that started with the company, we were, they were able to do that up till over 100 employees. You didn't come on unless you met with them. And they made sure that everybody that came on board was, um, you know, was solid. So what we have up, up in you know, we have in San Francisco, we have, you know, top tier, you know, software engineers, uh, you know, Denver, which uh, is kind of our operations hub. We've got our engineers, we've got our finance, you know, we've got all those kinds of folks. And then up in, in North Dakota, um, you know, we have, we have electricians, you know, we've got master electricians that are our employees. We have, um, you know, our technicians, uh, computer technicians that work out in the field. We have mechanics. So really everybody within the organization is very specialized and very skilled. And, you know, because of that, they really kind of take pride in, in what they're doing. And one of the first things that struck me as I, as I went around and started meeting people was, you know, again, because you don't have an industry that you're hiring out of per se, mm -hmm. everybody's kind of coming from something a little bit different. And we'll, so we may have all guys that are electricians. They've, you know, no one's ever wired up data centers on a well site before, you know, um, you know, same with our techs and, and our mechanics. And so they just, they, they really brought in the right people. So for me, you know, as opposed to coming in and, 
having to create all these systems and, and everything else, what it allowed me to do was kind of come in, um, get a laptop, sign in. And that second week I was up in North Dakota and I was just in the field. And so the, for me, it's a matter of, all right, we've done a great job in operating safely and doing, you know, doing good things. Now we're just, we're just growing so quickly. You know, how do we scale this? So somebody's got to go up and be a secretary ultimately and, and write down the best practices, write down and, and create SOPs. Uh, and then, you know, kind of run them through the, the risk assessment models and kind of all those to where then you start building your policies and processes and procedures off of that. So, you know, and again, like I said, that's, that's really kind of the, um, the, the, the idea of meritocracy uh, mm -hmm. that we have. And then from a safety perspective and kind of the safety philosophy, I guess, for lack of a better term, I, I, I always hesitate to throw philosophy around because it's just, it's just, I'm not, that's not me. Um, but the, our core value is think like a mountaineer. And we have, you know, the, the founders of the company, um, you know, they're, they're mountaineers and a lot of the, the guys within the organization, uh, men and women that, that climb as well. And so when you look at, at that, it really kind of translates well. There was several years ago, I think it was about 20 years ago, they found um, George Mallory's body on Everest. And, you know, the big thing was, well, did, you know, was he really then, did he, did he summit? Was he the first one to summit? Did he, you know, and at the end of the day, it's more important to make it off the mountain than it is to make it to the top. Mm -hmm. And that's really kind of the, the safety philosophy um, within, within our company. And because the very, very top, you know, that's their background, you know, that's what they believe. And that's what they, what they kind of push down. Um, you know, I've actually been in the field and had to have conversations with, with the vice president of operations about why I think that, it is safe to go ahead and, and continue an operation that we're doing because he's seeing weather reports where he's not 100% confident and having to, to stop and go through. And so to see, to, to be in that type of environment where I'm not having to pick up the phone and call and fight to do the right thing, where I'm getting phone calls out in the field from executives saying, hey, are you doing the right thing? Are we doing this the right way? You know, um, are we good to, to do this crane lift today? Do I need to do I need to pay to have all this equipment set on location for two days so that we can get folks home before the roads get icy? You know, that is to me is I remember the first time I had to shut down an offshore rig at, you know, three hundred thousand dollars a day. And, you know, I had to shut it down. And, and I remember uh, calling uh, calling home and saying, hey, I just want to give you a heads up, um, start saving some money because I'm out of work and uh, and really believing that that was going to happen. And that's you know, that's that's not. It's not that way here. And um, it's pretty cool. It's it's really it's exciting to be a part of, to have that kind of um, you know, to have that support. But you know, then like I said, there is no, there's no right way to do it and no wrong way to do it until we figure out how to do it. And and that's you know, that's exciting. Okay. So that's again, I, I feel like you're teeing me up really nicely here because you're you're hitting on exactly the things that that I've been so curious to talk to you about. So <laughs> I, I think that in, so you've got this amazing team, you've got all these people who, who kind of, they know their shit enough for you not to have to worry about the low level things. Right. But what I'm curious about it. And again, if we think about the audience of kind of, we've got folks listening who are, you know, let's say your peers, your colleagues, folks who are building um, or responsible for similar things. And maybe they're operating under different constraints in the, in the organizations that they work in. But I think you are in such an, interesting use case because you're in this organization where you know as you explained it um there are there are other people who are safety professionals at tech companies yeah but their primary concern is probably ergonomics in the office and you know they've got too much money and so they hire some safety person to have some cushy job that right. in an environment where there really are very few high potential um, occurrences in your case you're overseeing operations that are very kind of traditional industrial operations that have this high tech component. So you have that same, it's, it, it's still a kind of regular safety job. You've got high voltage electricity, you're operating in oil fields, you're doing all these other things. So can you- 100, 100 ton crane lifts. Uh, there you go. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, those are all things that 
that I can sort of empathize with. I know the last uh, ship that I worked on, we had a hundred ton and a 250 ton crane doing heave compensated lifts in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, and yeah. you're, you know, th that that's that's the real stuff, uh, yeah. or at least in in my brain. And that's probably not fair to say. But can you help me understand? And and we can dig into this, and maybe we'll kind of pull a few threads here. But is it where do you start as you're as you're looking at this organization that's growing? And this is not going to this kind of honeymoon phase is not going to last forever. Right. Um, how are you thinking about putting systems in place now? And what are the biggest differences you've seen in the way that you have space to solve problems? Because I think that's probably the biggest difference here, not only from a, a resourcing perspective, because I happen to know that you guys have raised a not insignificant sum of money. So they, they, they're incentivized to get it right. Um, right. in a way that that a lot of safety professionals probably don't have a lot of experience with as far as mm -hmm. access to budget and things like that but um yeah can you just help me understand like where 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 do you see yourself going from here because basically you, you're you are it as far as safety at Crusoe right now uh i i am today but that's that's going to be changing here very very soon um okay. you know it's what's been pretty cool like i said my background um i'm used to remote management you know in yeah. in, in in finance so I'm very good at being able to prioritize, figure out what needs what, what can, you know, what can go out till next week, and then how to handle and deal with situations um, in the field. You know, because we do computing, uh, one thing that I have that a lot of folks in the oil field don't is reliable internet and phone service uh, when I'm on a well site. So I will brag about that. That's pretty amazing, but that's just because our engineers um, are, are brilliant. But so for me, it really was a matter of kind of coming in and, okay, what, what are the things that we do? And I just kind of started from scratch. It's like, okay, we do, let's, I'm going to go to a, a deployment and I'm going to watch us bring in our equipment. I'm going to watch us, um, you know, rig everything up, set everything up, run the tests, get the, you know, get the generator going, get the, the data center going. And it really was just a matter of kind of sitting down, asking a lot of questions of folks, um, I will tell you that the, just by the questions that they ask, it really kind of pointed me in, in the direction uh, that we needed to go. We've, you know, a great thing about Crusoe is, you know, like I said, we don't have, our employee retention is just, it's like nothing I've ever seen. People don't leave. Um, and so that's, so there's just a ton of experience within Crusoe and folks coming on board and sticking around. But we've also done that with our, our uh, service companies. Um, you know, the ones that were kind of there from the, the beginning and kind of from the get-go, um, you know, we still work with those same companies. And so they're kind of growing along with us. Um, my background coming from, uh, you know, coming from international and, and working at ports, you know, I love cranes. I'm like a complete crane geek. And that's probably the one thing I think that I've seen in the oil field just across the board that folks really don't have a lot of experience with outside of, of crane companies, you know, whether it be an oil and gas operator, whether it be a, a you know, a, a drilling contractor, you know, crane companies come in, they do what they need to do. You know, I'm coming from, I'm coming from a world where I'm doing hundred and 120 uh, crane lifts a day. So for me, it really kind of started with looking at that and saying, okay, what are the things that we have guys that know a lot about, like let's said, electricity or technicians or mechanics, um, but those things kind of on the peripheral, you know, those are the things that they don't have a lot of experience. So the first thing was to be able to start kind of training them on what they should expect of the ser service companies. What does this look like when this comes in? What does this look like? You know, how, how do you, um, you know, when, when you're bearing pipe, you know, what are the things you have to watch for with, with trenching? Um, you know, we're, you know, explaining spoil piles, just things that, you know, that typically people will just kind of, kind of blow past. Um, cranes, it was a matter of, like I said, we've, we have these, these um, you know, they're, they're huge. These lifts are massive. And while, you know, everybody's got kind of their critical lift policy and it's, you know, typically it's just within, um, it's within crane capacities. Well, for me, I looked at, it, I'm like, you know, we've got this real specialized equipment and this takes a long, you know, long time to come through. You know, I really want to take th this pride 
of doing a good job that my team has, I want to equip them so that whoever it is can kind of show up on location and very quickly see, you know, hey, this is right or hey, this is wrong. And so it was going kind of going back to the service companies and saying, look, you know, here's the thing. I know you do this on a regular basis. I may have somebody different today or somebody that's never, you know, moved this piece of equipment. And so it really kind of became standardizing those processes and procedures so that when someone can come out, you know, at the, you know, brand new, uh, you know, brand new roustabout level guy, he can see, wait a minute, that's not the way that you pick up, uh, you know, a generator. That's, you know, that has eight lifting points and, and all those have to be done. And, um, you know, and I've seen that drawing. So all of those drawings go out uh, on location ahead of time. So, you know, where we go from, from there, it really is, there's a lot of mentoring that's going on. Again, as I said, because we do have that, uh, uh, you know, we do have that employee retention. For me, it's, I'm really kind of being able to kind of get into the weeds and get kind of, you know, behind it and really just start taking, um, taking these things that they're doing and taking these things that they're telling me and just formalizing them. Like I said, so, you know, we just, we, uh, we're growing in Colorado. Um, I, I don't even know how many data centers we've put in in Colorado just in the last three months. We, we went from, from, you know, zero to hundred miles an hour. And so we've had to bring new folks in. Well, I can take, I, North Dakota hasn't slowed down. So mm. now we have these, you know, we have these standard procedures and things that, that we just kind of roll uh, and put in through there. But because, like I said, because we have these mechanics coming in with different backgrounds, you know, they're seeing things from a completely different perspective. Um, it's, it's, our organization is very flat. And so for me, is a lot of kind of acting as a, as a liaison between maybe an engineer and, you know, a mechanic. And so when something happens, we can, you know, we can go directly to the folks that are, you know, building these, um, you know, building these units, building these generator units for us, because they're ours. And it's not, you know, I always say that one of our greatest strengths is, is because we are able to be very nimble and we can move very quickly. Um, when we, you know, recognize something, uh, we can just, you know, we can get it fixed now. I would say the biggest challenge that I have, and, and, and it's nothing new, it's every single uh, safety professional has to deal with, is a matter of getting folks to share the things that they're doing, safety observations. I mean, we know, we know all day that these guys are walking around. We've, I've got folks walking out there, they're seeing things, they're being like, Man, that's messed up. And then they're fixing it. And then they're kind of moving on to the next thing. Um, you know, the other part of it is that, you know, everybody, everybody is an ownership stake in the company. We all, you know, that's one of the things when we come on board, we're owners of the company. Uh, for me, a big challenge is getting these guys to slow down and helping them to understand, you know, fatigue management, helping them to understand exposure, helping them to understand, you know, heat related illness, all these kinds of things, because there's, there's so much pride in building things from scratch. We, you know, that's the type of folks that we have that, you know, just getting them to slow down is probably one of the biggest challenges I have right now. It's a pretty cool challenge to have, um, but it, it really keeps you on your toes. You know, you've really got to kind of be watching and, and understanding that folks are just going to move on. They're going to fix stuff and they're just, they're, they're going to get on to the next thing. It's really trying to you know, as I said, with some of these international projects, it's really about making things scalable. So I can, uh, I, I can go to, you know, I can go to North Dakota, I can go to Montana, I can go to Colorado, or I can go to one of the other countries where we're uh, going to have things this year, and it's going to look the same. But also, too, then I can backfill as I need, you know, as we need uh, technicians, or we need um, something in one in one area that we can pick them up, we can move them in there and immediately, you know, it's plug and play and they can kind of get things where they need to go. So for me, I guess, right, long answer to a short question um, is a lot, a lot of days it feels like I'm, I'm corralling and I don't mean corralling like, like herding cats corralling. I mean, like, you know, trying to, trying to get folks to, to, you know, to look at things as a marathon versus a sprint. Mm. <clears throat> You know, I, yeah, I think the, being in a situation where, where you're an owner and you see that level of dedication from the people around you, again, that's uh, good problems, I would say, that, that you're dealing with there. Um, so, so those are the challenges you're having. I'm curious, and maybe there's no answer to this question, but 
you know, you've talked a lot about the diversity of perspectives that you're facing and just having these, you know, being surrounded by all these people who are rock stars in, in the various domains that, that they have responsibility. Has there been anything where, as you think about the direction for, let's say, you know, kind of the way Crusoe thinks about safety mm-hmm. or, and, and as those processes begin to be built, has there been anything that's surprised you based on feedback you've gotten from outside perspectives where you say, maybe, maybe we're not going to go in that direction or, or maybe that you're, you know, people coming with these novel takes that make you take a step back and say, shit, I would have never thought about it that way. That's uh, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> but honestly, you know, there's, I kind of get checked every day. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I've had some, I've had some ideas about uh, when I first came in, as far as metrics and reporting, kind of how I envisioned things and, and where I wanted to go. And it was kind of a stale, um, you know, it was kind of stale. It was like, okay, well, I've got this, these reports, these things that I've done in the past, and I've kind of honed these over, over years and they've worked and, um, you know, going in and, and meeting with, you know, meeting with the op, ops folks in Denver and um, having them just being like, you know, no, that's, that's not, you know, that's not the direction that we want to go. That feels very much like, that feels very much like a rule for a rule and we mm-hmm. don't want to do it. Um, I think, I think leading and lagging indicators is probably the best uh, example that I could give you right now. Um, you know, everybody has that when they're, when, when they're trying to build that safety program, they want to start looking for leading indicators. You have these ideas in your head. Of course, there's, you know, safety observations, um, you know, near misses, those types, and, and certainly you have to track those. Um, but because, so I had to interview with, when I started, I had to interview with every field manager. So the, the like electrician, you know, the, the, the electrical manager, the, um, you know, the deployment manager, uh, the rotating uh, equipment manager, I had to interview with every single one of those. And they had to feel comfortable with the way that I was approaching things and what I wanted to do. So you know, before I even came on board during the recruiting process, it, it, it was important that there was, you know, that there was collaboration and that they felt that they could work. And, and so what's been cool about that is as I'm sitting here and looking at, um, at leading indicators, they, they're giving me what they want. You know, I'm like, Hey, what are, you know, what are the things that you guys are doing out there? And, you know, give me, give me your metrics. What did you do last month? And, you know, they're, they're saying, well, we did this, we did this, we did this. And it's like, okay, well, um, you know, so call outs, you know, is that something that, that we should have, or is that something that's indicative of a problem somewhere else? And um, so with that being the case they they've been kind of feeding me the things that are creating kind of that, that the, the rushing, those, you know, those kind of uh, the fire drills for lack of a better term. And, you know, of course, as you know, that's one of the, you know, one of the things is, you know, being on a boat, um, it gets, it gets tense and it gets stressful uh, the longer you're out there. And as that tension kind of, you know, as, as that tension rises, um, you know, that's when people start getting hurt. And so we've kind of put our leading indicators and really looked a lot at just kind of the cultural and morale piece of it as well. And so we're kind of measuring those. So that, like I said, it, for can, me, just, just to jump in there, can, can you give us some examples as much as you're comfortable of like, what are you actually tracking today? Cause I, I'd be curious to know if that, is that a pretty standard set or is there anything in that list that that's people might be surprised to hear? Um, I don't, you know, I don't know if it would really be like, I don't think I've reinvented the wheel um, by any means, but I'm not tracking percentage of scheduled maintenance is performed within 30 days of the due date. How's that? Um, so I'll give you, I'll give you deployments as, as an example. Um, you know, what, what I'm kind of running through on that is I'm doing it by, um, piece of equipment. And so we're kind of looking at those, but I'm tracking them on a weekly basis. And so, so it's not just a, Hey, what'd you do this month? It's, you know, on, on the, this week, these are the pieces of equipment that we use. These are the things that we did. And it allows us, you know, it allows us to kind of look, um, to be able to then go and work with our logistics team. I work with uh, one of our logistics managers. Um, you know, I talk to him quite often and a lot of it has to do with, you know, what's coming through, what's moving, uh, what equipment's gonna be where, uh, you know, him working with our service companies to make sure that they've kind of got their stuff lined out ahead of time 
so that we don't have bottlenecks. Um, but I've never done that before. I've never, I've never tracked uh, equipment movement to this with this type of granularity. But I see, I mean, I see the benefit. It's 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 awesome to to be able to look and and track your critical lifts and and track all that stuff. Like I said, by you know having it down to these five day windows, and you can kind of look at how things are being spaced out. Um, you know, of course, there's challenges with you know due to supply chains. Um, we got a lot of equipment from Canada. We had the you know the trucker, um, the the truck driving strike and shutting things down, and you know of course moving stuff in in you've got frost uh, frost laws and kind of all that. So being able to have that type of granularity and looking at things moving and pieces moving as opposed to just here's how many crane lifts we had you know last mm-hmm. month or here's how many crane lifts we had last week. Um, it's data then that that if it starts to if we start to see a hazard just in how things are going, we can take this back to the engineers, we can take this back to logistics and say, you need to get with this supplier and, and find out what's happening so that, you know, things are kind of hitting, things are hitting location where you can pick them up once, put them where they need to go. Not, okay, well, let's get all these offloaded off this truck. This stuff's got to come. Now we're going to put this here. Now we got to pick these again, you know, having to, having to touch things two and three times. And, you know, that, that's also a big, one of our, one of our, um, uh, you know, one of our core values is resource efficiency. And, you know, this is, allows us to do it. You know, when, when you look, you know, the accountants look at it and they're like, this is fantastic. It saves us money. Um, from a safety professional, you know, a safety perspective, you're like, hey, the, the less times, you know, if I have to pick everything twice, I've, I've you know, doubled my hazards. And, yeah. you know, we've, we've gone, you know, as I said, because of the, uh, just because of the lead times and things like that, we treat everything as a critical lift. We, we get uh, lifting plans uh, from our crane operators and standardized rigging plans before they even show up on a location. So I give that to, you know, I give that to whoever is out on location and they, they know right then and there, they know how to look at rigging to make sure that it's, that it's adequate, but to be able to say, Hey, all this stuff has been checked. It's been engineered. These are the right slings to use. These are the right, uh, you know, these are the right shackles. We know that every piece of rigging um, is correct. And we also know that the crane companies, our crane providers are bringing it. Um, because they've committed to do that up front. And mm-hmm. So that's, I guess that's kind of one example. It's a, like I said, a long, long answer to a short question. It, it, it's honestly, it's one of those things that it almost sounds like you could brush it off, but I, I bet there are the percentage of safety professionals that are having that proactive operational insight is pretty small and it makes total sense why that would have such a big impact in helping you be ahead of the game rather than just reacting to what's going on. How, how does that look? Are, are you just sort of interfacing with the operations team on an ad hoc basis or are you guys proceduralized to the point where they're, you know, pumping this off to you every Monday morning in a specific format? What, what does that actually look like in practice to give you that insight into what's going on? Sure, sure. So, so you know, I'll give you a, uh, an example. One, there's one piece of equipment that we have, and I think it's it's over 100 tons. It's uh, it's our generator uh, package, and so that's built. That's a you know, it's a building. Um, it's it's built, and it has eight lifting uh, points on it. So, the the lifting points are are spread out just because of the weight distribution with within within the building itself. So, in my experience in the past all that people will look at is, okay, what is the rigging capacity? How do I rig this up and not, not break slings? Well, we're looking at it from the standpoint of, okay, this has been engineered a certain way where things are, there's going to be stress that's put on, uh, you know, put on the frame. Uh, A lot of this stuff is, is, you know, the tolerances are, are pretty tight. So just that little bit of flex or something like that, um, you know, can create, to create problems. So we've taken the, the drawing, the engineering drawings from the actual manufacturer and said, hey, I want to see the lift plans that you guys have in your yard when you guys load these things up. So they then have sent those to us and I have those. And then anytime we sign up a new, uh, you know, a, a crane service provider, we will send them the engineering drawings from that company and say, look, here's everything that's coming. Here's what you got. Um, you know, take the time now so you don't have to figure it out on location. Take the time now, configure your rigging, tell me what it's going to look like, and then send it to me. So every crane operator um, that we work with has taken the time to do that. So if I show up on on a location and XYZ crane is going to be there, 
I know what their rigging configuration is. I know what spreader bar they use. I know how they rig their slings. I kind of know how they do everything. So it goes from a matter of not just safety, right? Not making sure we don't drop it, but making sure that the, the equipment is cared for, that everything is happening the way that it's engineered. And so that we don't run into problems down the line. You know, again, right, the, 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 the answer should never be to not, uh, or to do the job in an unsafe way. And so what we do is just everything that we can to be proactive and ensure that they don't have to decide, well, do I do this in an unsafe way or do I not do it at all? It really is about setting those folks up out on location that, um, that they don't have to do it. And then also, you know, those are the little things like we're saying, if you've got to wait for somebody to bring out additional rigging, because we didn't take the time to do it right in, in the first place. Now you've gone from being able to get off location at three, be home at five o'clock. Now you're talking about a 12 hour day or a 14 hour day where, where your folks are just, you know, they're frustrated because they thought they were going to do something. I mean, so much of it has to do with, with just morale and setting them up to win. Um, you know, one of the reasons that I think is, is good is we don't have people going, you know, those idiots in the office, you know, we don't, we don't have that. Um, and so as far as how that works, it's, we get out in front of it. That's part of kind of the MSA. So what I was saying about, uh, you know, working with my logistics uh, manager is as soon as we start going, you know, when we go into a new basin or we, you know, do any of that, that's part of those initial communications with, um, you know, with, with those service providers. I'm involved, I'm on every kickoff. Um, I'm in every kickoff meeting. So I'm seeing all the drawings, I'm seeing everything, you know, before we even get out on location and do dirt work. And, you know, my feedback is being solicited. Hey, Eric, you, you know, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And, you know, like I said, to the point where, you know, I have, I, gosh, what was it? I had an engineer last week who didn't know anything about fire extinguishers. And he's, uh, you know, he's, he's wanting to set up like a little, little electronic test bench. And he's like, you know, what do I need to do for this? And um, it's just, it's, it's, it's awesome. You know, I'm getting, I, I, I don't have to do that fighting to get folks to talk to me um, like I used to. <laughs> I'm tired. I'm mute, muted trying to do a recording. Uh, no, I, I think that that's, I think this is such a great example of, of part of what we're trying to have this show be about, which is that I think a lot of people maybe without hearing all this context might think, Eric, like, that's operations job. Why are you doing this? But I think when you when you articulate it in this way, it's a you're you're looking at the problem from kind of a first principles perspective and say, hey, this is where all the risk is. And if I don't understand the details, I'm not going to be able to be a you know a guide and a support to our team that makes them feel set up to win. So yeah. I can't go and draw boxes around this to say, like, I'm here to be the guy who makes sure you tick the I have a lifting plan box. And instead, you're there actually making sure that it happens. And, and again, I, I'd encourage anyone who, who's looking at, you know, either that specific problem or has an analogous problem in their work site. Like, wh where are those opportunities where you can just kind of shake things up and, and do things in that uh, uh, or to just have that foundational impact, cut, cut things off the knees and, and solve the problem before it becomes an issue? I think, um, um, and, and again, I think that's one of those things where that where I think like a mountaineer core value yeah. really comes in. Um, you know, with, with, with that, I guess you say climbing or really any type of outdoor activity, uh, you know, conditions change very, very quickly. And, you know, you're, you're, you're climbing, everything's nice. It's a great sunny day. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, all of a sudden weather comes in or, uh, you know, things change very quick. And North Dakota is a lot like that. Um, you know, you get up out there and, and we get some insane winds and some crazy winds and, and things. Uh, so it really, it really does come down to, you know, taking that time on the front end. Um, and then I have, so we're saying it's lean as far as, you know, health and safety, right? I'm the only health and safety guy. Um, but the reason for that is I get administrative support within every single department. So instead of me, you know, instead of it going to, to me, to an admin in the, in the safety department to do this or to do that, you know, there are folks within every, every department, you know, that, I work with to coordinate the training that has to, to be done with them, or like I said, logistics and working with them on the, uh, you know, on the MSAs. Uh, you know, last week I, I went up to North Dakota and was able to actually have, you know, have a morning to be able to spend with uh, one of our service providers. You know, we did a, a last year, we had a, a you know, company-wide safety meeting and, 
you know, shut down for four hours to just kind of run through and, and just kind of a refresher or refocus before we went into the holidays. Um, because we all know that that's when, when things kind of uptick. But our service, our service companies came, they sent their folks um, to listen to me talk for four hours and, and give presentations. And so we really, there's just, there's just so much that we do on the front end that um, it allows me to be able to do that. It, the fact that, the fact that I am the health and safety manager and that I have the responsibilities that I have, it really speaks to the, to the caliber of folks we got out there. I mean, we just, you know, we're, we're on the verge of 250,000 man hours uh, since our last reportable, you know, that's, that's outstanding. Um, and that is, you know, we were talking about it again today. We had our uh, once a month, we have uh, our entire operations department. Once a month, our entire company has a conference call where we go through and talk about strategic initiatives, things that are coming, things that are happening. Everybody has dialed in, you know, to the company, but you know, the, we didn't say we're going to have 225,000 man hours, you know, without a recordable, it's just, you know, again, every single one of them comes in every day, every task, every hour, They're like, okay, what do I need to do? How am I going to do this? And how do I do it the right way? Um, hmm. You know, I mean, I had a, a, I had, I get questions about, uh, you know, I had a, a message a couple of days ago from, from one of the, a new employee who wants to understand gloves. I mean, you know, the, typically the, the conversations with glo about gloves or why aren't you wearing your gloves? And, you know, here's somebody who's like, hey, you know, I was looking at these. I've noticed some people doing this. And what do you think about these gloves? Can I do this? And, you know, it's just, it's, it's pretty cool, you know, to, to have that. They're, they really do, um, you know, kind of open the door uh, to these conversations and, and the coaching that needs to happen. And so while in, in some ways people go, oh my gosh, that's, you know, I, I couldn't imagine being bothered like that all the time. I'm trying to do, you know, I'm trying to do this or that or whatever. And, and I got somebody asking me about gloves and it's like, no, this is, you know, I've got, I've got a guy who's been with the company for 60 days and he's never had to deal with these things. And he's like, you know, help me understand, you know, what I need to do, why I need to do this, you know, in, in, in a lot of other, in past lives, that would be a guy that was like, well, it's too cold to wear work gloves. I'm just gonna wear my ski gloves and, and do this thing here this way. Instead of being like, hey, I don't understand why we wear these, um, but can you explain to me why we wear these? And then can I get warmer ones or different ones or, you know, whatever. Um, and I, I've, I've found so much of it, the things that you're talking about that, you know, that, that really kind of digging in and, and dialing in. Um, you know, I, I remember having a, a conversation with it. It was with a, a Halliburton, Halliburton hand, um, you know, years ago. And every, and he was amazing. Like, I, I just, I love this guy. He was one of my favorite people. Great attitude, hard worker. You know, it was just fantastic. And every time I'd come out, he was a, a solid hand. And every time I'd come out, he'd be in there working on the auger or working on whatever he was working on, not wearing gloves. And it was, I think the third day, finally, I walked up, I was like, Pat. I'm like, man, I'm like, help me understand. And he's like, well, I'm, I'm trying to do this and this and I can't get it right. And, and, uh, and I'm like, no, I'm like, those, those gloves are made, you know, they're mechanics gloves. I'm like mechanics gloves are made for manipulating you know, small nuts and bolts and whatever. And he's like, yeah, but I can't wear these. And I'm like, you know, anyways, through the course of a conversation, come to find out that their procurement department only purchased large and extra large. This guy needed a medium. So he just, it was as simple as he wasn't getting the right size that he needed. We got, I went in, in my office, I had a couple pairs and, you know, give him a pair of mediums. And I never talked to that guy about gloves ever again. And it really, like I said, for me, it's that it's taken a little bit of time on the front end. You know, the fact that I had to spend 10 minutes talking to this guy about gloves, it's like, you know, you should just, you, you just tell him to do it and move on. Well, that's fine. I'm going to be telling him to do it every, you know, every day. He's going to hate seeing me coming. I'm going to hate walking over towards him to the point where I'm probably going to avoid it on a day that I just don't want to, you know, put up with that crap. But instead we're able to then do that. And, and then it's not only him, now we're able to go to Halliburton and be like, hey, this is not a bash on Halliburton. There's plenty of things to bash them about. This isn't one. Um, I don't know if I can say that. But, you know, it, 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 I then took that back to their ops manager, who then goes back to their warehouse, come to find out that they're just, they're just ordering whatever they're ordering. They're not taking a look at what's getting sent out. And so they're sending out stuff that doesn't fit people. You know, they're sending out the wrong size boots or this or that. And I never had, you know, I had never had another PP issue. In fact, what happened then was these guys are like, hey, this guy gets stuff handled. 
they're not getting something they needed. They were coming into my office and saying, I need this or I need that, or, you know, I don't have the right tools and, and we're getting the stuff out there. It, it just became a safer, it became a safer place to work. And the interactions became just much more pleasant because, you know, for that, that second, like I said, some like the pickle again, somehow that makes sense to him. And uh, <laughs> you just got to figure out why it makes sense to them. You might be wrong or they might be wrong, but you know, you're going to figure it out together and, and it's just going to be, it's going to be enjoyable. Mm. No, I, I, yeah, I, I think you're totally right. And I think that, that kind of just taking that step back and, and thinking about the problem, maybe in a new way and being open to the idea that maybe it's not just as simple as cracking the whip and put your gloves on. And I shouldn't have to tell you this. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, like I give said, people I just, some credit. Yeah. I've seen that too many times. I've also seen, you know, I, uh, I've just seen that happen too, where in the office, you know, something will happen, they'll have an event, you know, a near miss or, or whatever. And um, before they've even done an investigation, they want to have an answer, you know, on that first conference call and they'll roll out some big initiative. You know, I, I remember this is, this is one of my favorite stories and, and I credit the folks for trying to do something, but sometimes you don't just do something, take a minute and figure out the right thing. So there was a, um, uh, with back back trucks and you know suction hoses. So this was in this was in a, a this was in one of the basins. And so everybody out there uses cam lock hoses. That's just standard. We're using cam lock hoses. And so they had a, a, a driver. I guess he he didn't he didn't clamp one down all the way, and sucked you know sucked up uh, you know water or whatever. This is in uh, West Virginia where you have to where they treat rainwater as uh, waste. Uh, any rainwater that touches a, a well site is, is considered oil field waste. But so then, you know, goes to blow his line and, you know, blows the line, the hose pops off and, and, uh, and almost hits him in the face. That's just, that's, you know, that's bad, I think is the technical term we use in the industry. So this is bad. Um, well, the, before anything even happened that next morning, the decision had been made that across the board, there would be no more um, you know, only hammer unions were allowed on trucks. Okay, well, that's fine, but you're not going to get every single company in a basin to retrofit their trucks. So what do they do? They just had a crossover. <laughs> they put a crossover. So now we still have that same, you know, we still have the same cam lock hose, but now we're going to go ahead and add a sledgehammer to the mix to make it safer. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, but that's one of those things where, again, it's not taken, like you said, just not taking that step back and be like, okay, what do, you know, what do we need to do? When really the answer was, you know, you give the guys the, um, uh, you know, what do you call it? The, just give them Velcro, those Velcro straps that you put around and they're problem solved. Um, hmm. But it just, I just find that too often where people it's, it's they're, they're, they want to do something so that they can say they did something. And at the end of the day, like I said, to me, it's, it goes all the way back to that assessing, you know, assessing risk and then mitigating a hazard not looking at, at what's the, you know, what rule did they not follow and what rule do we need to make? Yeah. I, I, uh, it's funny the, the more and more I've been having these conversations, the more it, it sounds almost like woo woo, but it's like safety in some ways is you're, it's like the mindfulness department. It's like, yes. are we going to not, not let the, the day-to-day -day pressures interfere with our ability to make smart decisions? Because I'm sure if you traced out those decisions within the organization, it's because, the leader feels some pressure from their boss to mm -hmm. have a resolution. And I think if you, if you asked every one of those people, do you want to be creating pressure here that ultimately makes us make bureaucratic decisions that make it worse to work here and mm -hmm. ultimately don't solve the problem? They would all say, well, of course, if you phrase it like that, I don't want to do that. But yeah. no, you, you need to be the person who's, who's creating that space for people to to take that deep breath and just realize that some of this stuff's a little bit crazy. Um, well, if you, you talk to, you talk to folks that have worked with me in the, in the past on projects and kind of the, what, when I talk to them about something is I'll, I always tell them, it's like, look, I'll explain to you the why right now. I just need you to do this. And then, Hey, in the galley, let's, you know, grab, grab some food. And we'll talk about it. And I always make the promise that I will either tell you why. And if it's just a rule and I don't get it, I'm going to tell you that, but just, out of respect for me, just do it. And when I handle it that way, you know, the, the times when I just look at, I'll just look at a guy and be like, it's a rule, dude. And they're like, okay, man, I got you. No sweat. I'll do it. And <laughs> it's, you know, but it, again, it, it has to be more than right. 
I'm your father and I said so. Um, so, or, or in, in the case, really, it almost comes across as more of like den mother sometimes is what I feel like. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. So, I, but, you know, one of the things I want to, I want to touch on here is you've, you've, you've painted this awesome picture, you know, clearly really strong culture. You know, I, I think it says a lot about the founders, to be honest, you know, how many times you've talked about core values on this call. I'm, I'm jealous uh, to be honest. That's, that's all. That's, that's, that's the dream. I think if they watch this, they'd be proud of you. So I'm curious, you know, you've, you've got this great kind of standard set, but you've also mentioned the velocity of the growth. You know, you were 50 people and you're over a hundred now you'll be 200 in six months. You'll be 500 in a year. What do you see? You know, I wouldn't be as naive to say, what is, how does safety evolve through all of those changes? Cause I think it's impossible to know, mm-hmm. but what's, what's your next focus? What's the next thing you want to add in here that you think is going to make the most sense as, as you try and navigate, you know, a company that's growing at the speed that you are. Okay. I, so, you know, I had to look back at a, actually had been thinking about this where I want to go um, this year. And I've got a, a meeting with my boss here to talk about Q2. Um, I had a, a program that I had done, with another organization and, you know, the, the smaller jobs where you don't, maybe you only have five, uh, you know, five roustabouts on a job, something small, somewhere where you're not going to put an on-site safety rep. And so what we were able to do is I, I created um, a curriculum for, you kind of designate one person um, on each crew and you kind of run them through uh, kind of a little bit more intensive, not necessarily an OSHA 10 or an OSHA 30, but a very practical, this is, you know, this is your job. This is what you do. Um, and teach them the basics on, you know, how to assess risk. The, my favorite one, and I'm not smart enough to have come up with this. I stole it. Um, I'll, I'll admit it all day long. Uh, I, I, I think that's, the, there, there's a David Bowie quote, you know, I, the only art, art, the only art I respect is the stuff that I can steal from. I don't think you need to feel bad about it. <laughs> Well, this company's no longer around anymore, so I, I don't think they won't sue me. Um, but they had a, an acronym that was FOCUS. Uh, of course, the oil field loves acronyms, right? Oof, but this one was oof. FOCUS. And it was, it was on all of their, you know, all their tally books, everything else. And it was, uh, it was falls, over, uh, overexertion, um, cuts caught between, uncontrolled uh, energy. Um, and so you just kind of like, Oh, I'm sorry. S slips and falls, right? Every safety guy likes to talk about slips, trips, and falls. Um, but and so that was all those. And you can literally walk up on a job and in 60 seconds run through every single one of those things and and be like, okay, you know, do I have any fall hazards? Is there any overexertion stuff that I need? You know, some equipment uh, to lift. You know, what are my cuts caught between? You know, is there any un- uncontrolled energy on this? You know, are there any slips, trips, falls? And you know, I mean, that's just one example, but what you what you're able to really do is you 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 drill down with you know one kind of individual on on each crew and kind of start building that so for me it's you know you can have you can have a whole team of safety guys and i guarantee you that when my, when a safety guy is on location everything's going to be perfect everything's going to be great everything's going to be whatever but for me it really is a matter of kind of now i've got folks that want to do the right thing um, I've got folks that have kind of come up and they're able to put together the, this procedure, this process. This is how we've done it safely up to this point. So now kind of start uh, teaching them how to assess. Uh, I think what's the saying goes, you're gonna, you'll get the level of safety that you're willing to walk past mm-hmm. and get them to be able to understand and recognize what it is that they're walking past and be able to do that where they can, they can walk up and know, you know, these aren't our sites. I'm, work, I'm walking up on an operator's site. I don't know, you know, I, I, have, I have an operation that's going to be happening. I don't know what they've got going on that day. I don't know if they have another service company out doing something else. So it's not enough to have a good JSA that we've sat and dialed down and written and everything else and then watch for changing weather. You know, that's just not enough. Being able to recognize, you know, the potential for SIMOPs, you know, what that means for you. So for me, it really just kind of is now giving, giving my folks in the field additional tools to be able to, to recognize those kinds of things um, as, they, as, as they happen, as they come up. And, um, you know, you get one person doing that and it's going to, 
you know, it's going to rub off on other people, right? You know, that's, they'll remember that, you know, Jacob said this last time we had this happen. Oh, you know, you know, crap, they've got, they've got, you know, trucks running in and out of location today. So we need to start, you know, we need to make sure that we're looking at where we're staging our equipment, where we're parking our trucks, where we're, you know, how we're doing our, our crane lifts, you know, just those types of things. I think for, for me, it really is just getting now down into that nuts and bolts and helping them understand how to assess risk. It, it sounds it sounds so simple, but it, man, safety is simple. It really just comes down to that and, uh, and being able to get everybody in the field thinking that way. Um, you know, Noble had the, um, they had every single, uh, you know, every uniform, everything said, uh, you know, it said safety leader. And again, it kind of comes out, you know, it can come off as sounding corny, but there's really no reason um, that every single person on location shouldn't be thinking that way. And like I said, the things that, that they're seeing us do on the front end before stuff happens there, you know, it's not just the office is yelling down at you, you know, do this, do this, do this, do this. Um, that's kind of my biggest, that's my, my kind of my vision. And then really getting that um, sharing of information and getting it through some, some of the, you know, some channels so that it's getting, as opposed to just when folks get back to the warehouse at the end of the night, or in the morning while they're having coffee, you know, that, that knowledge sharing is fantastic, but it mm. doesn't help. It doesn't help the guy I've got in North Park, Colorado. And that's what I want to, to see start happening. For sure. <clears throat> well, that sounds like, uh, you know, simple, not easy. You'll, you'll figure it out. <laughs> sounds like you, you guys have the right team in place to, to help that be successful. Uh, with that in mind, any, you know, you guys are growing quick. Is there any upcoming safety vacancies or anything like that you want to plug here you probably get a few people a few awesome folks reaching out or you don't uh, you don't want those dms no no actually um we do have we we have i, I would strongly encourage anyone to go look at the uh, at the crusoe energy website we are growing and you know as i said so just since i've come on board we've more than doubled and we will more than double again this year mm -hmm. uh it's a great, it's a great place. Like I said, it's a, it's a great place to work. It's fun. Um, it really is just an outstanding culture. So, uh, you know, we've got uh, engineer positions, network engineer. Um, we are going to have some EHS positions that are going to be opening up here, I would say within the next uh, couple of months. So mm -hmm. those as well. Um, but yeah, there it's, we're just growing so fast that it, it has to happen. So yeah, absolutely. And, and then, Aside from checking it out, see if there's vacancies, just check out what we do because it's awesome. And uh, you will, you'll look at the website and you'll scratch your head and as much information as you get, uh, you still, you know, you, you'll still be scratching your head. I, I mean, we're, I think the one thing that I'm most excited about now, you know, we've talked about Bitcoin and, um, you know, the, the, this, this, it's called uh, Crusoe, uh, you know, we've got the cloud base uh, stuff happening now. And I mean, the, they're running AI, you know, we're, we're developing AI and smart learning and 3D rendering, um, you know, we're doing medical research on well sites, you know, 20 miles from civilization. And, you know, there's medical, you know, cutting edge breakthroughs being made. It's just, it's so cool to be, you know, to be a part of, uh, like I said, just to be a part of it. And, you know, not just like, uh, like I said, I love it from an environmental perspective, you know, you can get, people can get, fighting all day long. Is climate change real? Is it not? Is it this? Is it that? Whatever. But at the end of the day, um, clean air is awesome. It's a really cool thing. And then seeing, uh, you know, seeing something that is being proactive, that is, is just like, like I said, when it comes to the environment, when it comes to the work that we're doing, um, you know, even just, even just, you know, creating good careers, a great company um, to work for, you know, uh, it's just, like I said, it's just exciting to be a part of. And I mean, it, you know, you go to the about us page, every single employee has a picture and a bio on our website. You, you just don't see that every single person is on there. And, uh, and that's just how we, how we are, you know, we, we you know, Chase and, and Cully, they, they get it. They understand that, um, that it's, it's all about the people in the field and they treat us that way. And, uh, it's, like I said, it's exciting to be a part of. It's fun to be a part of, and it's really rewarding. It's something that I'm proud of. Well, I think that's uh, you know, again, that's an amazing endorsement that I'm sure they'll uh, 
you know, it, it truly, I, I guess, as somebody who, who, who can empathize with their concerns as a founder, I think that that's what that you, you aspire to. I think there's a lot, lot that everybody can learn from, from what you guys are doing. So it's, it's super, super amazing. So with that, I'm just looking at the clock here. The time's been flying by, but we've really, really blown through it. I, uh, is there anything you want to, you know, any thoughts you want to get out there or anything you want to plug, uh, around, you know, you personally or Crusoe or anything like that? Well, uh, while we wrap things up. No, I mean, uh, I really, like I said, I really appreciate it. It was fun. Um, giving me an opportunity to sit around and tell stories. Um, you, I think probably the most grateful person will be my son because he won't have mm-hmm. to listen to stories tonight because, uh, I at least got some out of my system, but no, just like I said, I, I can't say enough great things, um, about Crusoe. And I know too, with what you're doing at OpsLock, you and I have talked considerably. It's a, it's just a completely different way of, of looking at safety. And I think that's, I think you and I kind of figured that out the first time that we talked. Um, so I just, I think it's really, it's fun to see kind of the direction that, um, you know, that safety has taken with the companies now, companies now understanding that it is something more than just a position that they have to have on an org chart and really, you know, understanding the importance of working safely. Um, it's just cool now that, that we're seeing, um, we're seeing safety professionals being treated uh, you know, as professionals and, and allowed to be creative and allowed to come up with, with some different ways of doing stuff. So it's fun to be a part of. I love it. Awesome. Well, I don't want to, I think that's a, a great place to end it. That's a, that's a good drop the mic kind of moment. And uh, <laughs> I just want to say again, uh, you know, thanks. Thanks so much for taking the time. I think it was awesome. I think there's a lot of things here that I think people are not only going to be, they're going to love hearing your excitement, but I think, you know, think, you know, some of the examples you shared, I think there's some real tactical stuff that people can take away and, and maybe approach their, uh, their, their work with a little bit more mindfulness and a little bit of a bigger picture approach so that they can ultimately just have bigger impact. And I think that's pretty awesome. So thanks so much, man. It was a lot of fun and, uh, appreciate it. It was, it was a, it's a good way to spend the morning. Thanks for listening to safety leaders now with Joe Meadows. This show is presented to you by OpsLog and produced by me, Valeria Carnau. Big thanks to Diala for the theme music and Hatch for editing the podcast. Our next episode comes out in a week. If you haven't already, please rate, review, and subscribe to Safety Leaders Now on any platform that you stream podcasts. If you want to connect with Joe, don't hesitate to reach out to him on LinkedIn at Joe Meadows. Thanks for listening. Catch you on the next episode.